text. Today we reach Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, and we're going to take a look at, at, at the impact of God's grace. And we ask ourselves a question, what is a lawless life? Should we live our lives in a lawless state? And we have many different opinions, we have many different ideas on on when we think of lawlessness, we think of chaos, we think of corruption, we think of uh, 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 people just taking up arms and fighting and killing each other. But this morning I want us to take a look, not from the physical aspect of a lawless life, but I want us to take a look at the spiritual aspect of living a lawless life in relation to the fact that Jesus Christ came Not to necessarily abolish the law, but to fulfill the law when he gave us amazing grace. We sang that song this morning. It was amazing grace that saved my soul. It was amazing grace that came into my life and changed me and transformed me. And so this morning as we look at this uh, a lawless life, I want us to, to begin to understand that yes, there are laws within God's word. Yes, there are, there, there are commands. Yes, there are things that he asks us to obey. But the bottom line is this, if you are not saved by grace, the law means absolutely nothing. If you have not come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, the law within God's word has no bearing upon your life other than this, the law kills, is what the Bible says, but Jesus saves. The law kills, but the grace of God is what saves us and sets us free. And so this morning as we go through the book of Acts chapter 15, I want you to glean, I want you to grasp the difference between the law of the word and the grace of the word. We'll begin with Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. It says, Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Saul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Verse 3, the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything. God had done through them. Then some of the believers that belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. So the question this morning is, is do you have to obey God? Do you have to obey the laws of God's word to earn, to keep, or to prove your salvation. This was the argument that was taking place here. The Pharisees were saying, these men, these women, they need to obey the laws that God established. And if they don't obey these laws, if they're not circumcised, then they cannot call themselves followers of God. They are not Jewish by nature. And so there's this debate, and, and, and Paul and Barnabas are saying, well, let's consider this. Let's, let's get into what Jesus Christ says. Let's begin to understand what grace is about to discover the truth about do we have to obey the law to a T? Do we have to earn salvation? Do we have to keep the law in order to prove that we have been changed and transformed? Do we have to obey the law in such a way that it's more of a burden than it is a blessing? Let's go on to verse number 7. It says, After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them. Let me say that again. God knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving who? The Holy Spirit. Hmm. He gave the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. Verse 9. He made a distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. 
The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. Verse 16, after this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the remnant, this is a powerful word here, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord. And the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does their things. That has been known for the ages to come. Verse 19, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. You see, the Pharisees wanted to make it hard. They wanted to make it challenging. They wanted to make it difficult for anybody to be converted, for anybody to come into the knowledge of who God was. We see Jesus Christ came to make it simple. Jesus Christ came and he laid down his life so that anyone might have life. That it's not through works, but it's through the grace of Jesus Christ. And Paul and Barnabas are saying, hey, listen, it's not about the works. It's about the work of one man. The work of Jesus Christ. James gets up and he begins to say, listen, grace needs no law. The grace of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, does not need the law to follow behind it. The law, Jesus came and he said, the law no longer is what is necessary. It is my grace that is sufficient for you. You see, grace actually overcomes the law. The law had been established. God established the law among the children of Israel. He gave the law to Moses, and he added some other laws as they were going through the, that, that period of time as a nation. He added laws, and he added these laws so that they would distinguish themselves, that they would look different from everybody else around them. And so the laws were very important to the Israels, to the, to the Israeli believers, to the Jewish men and women, because it distinguished them, themselves apart from others. So the law was important, but now Jesus Christ comes. And I am so thankful. <laughs> I am so thankful that Jesus came. Because the law, that James says, the law is so heavy, it's so burdensome, that there isn't even any of us that are able to keep the law completely. You see, the Bible says the law kills. And so if the law is there to kill, that means that there is none of us that are able to uphold the words of the law. God makes no distinction between law followers and lawbreakers. Let me read verse 8 and 9 again. It says, God knows the heart. He showed that he escaped them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. He made no distinction between us and them, for the purify, he purified their hearts with faith. God makes no distinction between law followers and lawbreakers. You know why? Because we are. Every single one of us here this morning, from the left to the right, from the front to the back, we are all lawbreakers. As I stand here this morning before you, I am a lawbreaker. I have broken the very laws that God has established. And therefore, there is no way that I should receive justification. There is no way that I should receive sanctification based on my merit alone. But praise God, he says, it's not based upon the law. It is based on what Jesus Christ has done. It is a faith that rises up with inside of us that says, I believe that Jesus Christ paid the price. I believe that his grace is sufficient for me. And so I'm going to step out in that faith. And James says in verse number nine, he says, he has made no distinction because he has purified their hearts. You see, friends, it's a matter of the hearts that we have to get down to. It is a heart issue in the world today. Why is the world going crazy? Why do we look around and see chaos, disorder? Why do we see so much trial and tribulation in the world? It's because it is a heart issue. It's not a physical issue. It's not passing more laws that are going to make things better. You can pass five million gun laws, and I can tell you there are going to still be people that commit crimes with guns. You can open up all of the subsidies that, that the world could possibly hold, and you can offer people that are in poverty all the subsidies in the world, and yet there will still be poverty in the world. Why? Because it's not a physical issue. It's a heart issue. It's a matter of the heart. And until God gets our heart, the law doesn't mean anything. We're going to see here a little bit later that what God has established in law, it is important, but for salvation, it really isn't. It's for what comes afterwards that we have to understand it. 
You see, none of us are law followers. Verse 10 tells us very clearly, none of us were able to uphold the test. It's like a heavy yoke that we bear. So this morning, you're all a bunch of lawbreakers. You're all on the run, okay? (laughs) We're all on the run. I'm just thankful that the Holy Spirit caught up to me. (laughs) I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit arrested my heart, that the Holy Spirit arrested my soul, and he said, hey, buddy, you're going to do some time. (laughs) And I did some time at an altar when I was five years old, and I said, Jesus, come into my life, forgive me my sins. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit has come and arrested my heart time and time again over the years, and he has arrested my heart at altars all across America, all across the world. And he said, hey, what you're doing isn't exactly what I want for you. What you're doing and how you're living your life isn't exactly where you need to be. And so the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. He got a hold of my life, and he began to change and transform me. And that's what he desires to do in your life this morning. Stop being bound by the law and be set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 3 Verses 9 and 10 says this. What then? Are we better than they? No, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jew and Gentiles are all under sin. As it is written, you're not righteous, you're not righteous, you're not righteous, you're not righteous, and you're not righteous. Ain't none of y'all righteous. There is none righteous, no not one. Woohoo! We're all a bunch of sinners today. <laughs> but we're all in need of a Savior. What then should we say? There is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.23, we know this. If, you, if you've ever been in church for any period of time, you know this verse, and you may have heard it being said before. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I must have sinned a lot because I'm really short, okay? And and so we've come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned and come short. In other words, as the moment we sin, the moment we do something wrong, the Bible says it separates us from the presence of God. It separates us from a relationship with God. Go back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. The very first sin that they committed separated them from a, having a relationship that God desired for them to have. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I tell you, unless the righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, Jesus came out and he said, listen, scribes, Pharisees, you know, you, you parade yourself about in righteousness. You think yourself to be holy. You think yourself to be good. But yet there's still things in your life that are wrong. And he says here, if your righteousness doesn't overwhelm, if it's not better than theirs, then you have no hope. And so he's saying they're rotten. They're miserable. They don't have hope. So how do you expect to have hope? Verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. Whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. Listen, do you hear that? If you are angry with a brother or sister. Some of you came in there this morning and there was some anger towards a brother or sister. There was some anger in your heart towards somebody else. You may not be going out and plotting to murder them, but Jesus said there's really not much of a difference there. The distinction is the same. If you have anger in your heart, you will be liable to judgment. If you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you'll be liable to hell of fire. Skip down to verse 27 of Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Ouch. Throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. What is Jesus trying to point out here? He's trying to point out that we are all sinners, that we are all guilty of something. If there's anger in our heart, if we looked at a woman, if we looked at a man with lust in our heart, it's just like committing adultery. He said it's it's all a heart issue. It's all a heart matter. If your eye offends you, pluck it out, throw it away. It's better to get rid of it than to fall into the pit of sin. Verse 48, it says... (laughs) I love this. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. (laughs) Be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wait a second. You just told me I'm a rotten, miserable sinner. God just told me that, that in my life it's a mess. It's full of garbage. It's full of disgusting stuff that you say separates me from you. And now you're saying you want me to be perfect? 
like God, my father, how is it even possible? How is it possible for you and I who are lawbreakers, you and I who are sinners, you and I who are unrighteous to become perfect like God? It is only possible through the grace of God. It is only possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You see, in order for us to become perfect, just as God is perfect, it must come by salvation alone. Salvation must be by grace alone. Salvation is not by your works. Salvation is not by what you have done. Salvation is not by living up to the Pharisees and what they have done. Salvation comes by grace alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God for eternal life. You see, church, faith alone is superior to faith and. Faith alone is superior to faith and. You don't need to add anything to the faith. Once you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you believed on him. You've called upon him. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells with inside of us, and we are changed. There is a new name written down in glory, and I thank God that my name has been written down. I thank the Lord that your name has been written down. I thank the Lord that there are names constantly being written down because of what we do through missions, what we do in our children's ministries, what we do with our refuge youth network. I thank the Lord that their names constantly be written down, not because they are good enough, but because they are so rotten, so miserable, that they recognize that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Look back at verse number 11. On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. We are saved by the grace of Jesus. That word grace means getting something good that you don't deserve. Grace means receiving something good that you don't deserve. Sin, the Bible says, brings about death. For the wages of sin is death. Every single one of us, because we have sinned, we've we've already declared this, we're all sinners. There's none of you that are good. (laughs) You've all sinned. The Bible says because you have sinned, the gift that you get is death. That's what we receive because of sin. There are consequences that come because we sin. When we do things that are wrong, there are consequences that happen. Just like when we do things that are good, there are consequences that take place. But you see, because we have sinned, there are consequences that come into our lives. But God says, I'm going to give you grace. In other words, I'm going to give you something that you don't deserve. Yes, you deserve death. But listen, what I'm going to give you, because of my grace, because you've accepted Christ, is I'm going to give you life. I'm going to give you new life. I'm going to give you abundant life. I'm going to give you a life that you've never had before. I'm going to give you a life that is not an earthly life, but it is eternal life with me in heaven. You see, God says, your sins condemn you to death, but my grace frees you to life. Church, I don't know about you, but that's what I want. I don't want the condemnation of my sin and my guilt and my shame to carry me and burden me down to the pits of hell, but I want God's grace to come and lift me up to the presence of heaven, my eternal life. God's grace is sufficient. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works from yourselves, it is a gift of God. It is not from works so that anyone can boast. Listen, I can't stand up here and say, Hey, well, this week I was so much better than Jim Yoho. This week, Jim, you know what Jim Yoho did this week? Oh, I'm not going to tell you what Jim Yoho did, but I'm glad I didn't do what Jim Yoho did. Oh, you're tis tiskin? Ha, huh, I'm glad I'm better than what you did this week. I don't even know what you did, but I'm glad I'm better. You see, this, this is what the law says, and this is what the law does. It puts one against the other. I'm better than him. I'm better than him. I'm better than you, better than you, better than you, better than you. Well, there's a couple teenagers I might not be better than just because they're young. Oh, you laugh, Ed. You're laughing. We all know we're better than you. I at least have some hair left. Yeah, uh uh-huh, see? (laughs) But see, this is what the law does. It puts one against the other. It says, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better. But this is what grace does. It says, ain't none of y'all good. (laughs) Because your little sin, your big sin, my little sin, my teeny weeny little sin that I did this week, guess what it does to me? 
It condemns me to death. But hallelujah, Jesus died on the cross and he said, oh, but wait a second. My grace is sufficient for you, Wayne. My grace is sufficient for you, Jim. My grace is sufficient for you, Jeremy. My grace is sufficient for you, Ed. My grace is sufficient for you, teenagers. My grace is sufficient for each and every one of you. It's not about saying I'm better. It's not about saying, well, I can, I can do better than they can do, or I didn't do this, or I didn't do that. The Bible says, what does it matter if you murder? What does it matter if you commit adultery? If what does it matter? What's the difference between anger and looking at somebody? There is no difference. And God says we all need the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Grace comes along and it says, for by him we are saved. It says, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus. And it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. How can we prove this? We are Christ's workmanship. Created for what? Created for good works. Created for good works that God prepared beforehand so that we may do them. In my sin, in my ugliness, in my yuckiness, God looked down and said, yeah, he's a mess. (laughs) Might take a while to clean him up, but I've got good works prepared for him. In your sin, God looked down and said, yeah, they're a mess, but I've got good works prepared for them. Gentlemen, in your life, you know you've struggled and looked and you've lusted and and, and some of us may have committed adultery. We may have done things that nobody even knows about, but God says, yeah, you're a mess, but listen, I still have created you for good works. My desire is that you would come under the grace of Jesus Christ that your life would be changed and transformed, that you'll be able to do the good works. See, church, we need to stop adding the law back in. Stop making up rules for people to fit into our own little Christian club. Because if it wasn't for the grace of God, we wouldn't be in our own little Christian club to begin with. You see, there is only one club, and it's the kingdom of heaven. And there's only one way to get in, and it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is through the grace that is offered Yes, we'd like to put rules and regulation. Yes, we'd like to say, well, I do this and you do that. And shame on you for doing that. But they're looking at us saying, yeah, well, what about this in your life? What about that in your life? You know the verse that says, huh, before you pull the speck of dust out of your brother's eye, pull the plank out of your own. There's a reason Jesus said that. Because all we see is the little nitpicky stuff of everybody else when he's saying, hold on, buddy. (laughs) You got a board the size of a two by four that's 20 feet long sticking out. You know, there's a reason they made the movie Pinocchio. Pinocchio thought he was better than everybody else. And then when he lied, what happened? His nose would grow. Do you imagine if that happened to every one of us when we lied? (laughs) Ain't no way you'd get through the door. (laughs) You know, you go to say hi to somebody. Take out 20 people on the way. (laughs) Why? Because our sinful nature rises up. Jesus says there's none righteous, no, not one. Look at verse 19. It says, therefore I have reached this decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God. Let's offer them the grace of God. As they go along, we'll see here in the next couple verses, as they grow in the faith, then we will allow them to know, then we will allow them to see that the laws that God established in the past, they were for good reason, not to bind us, but to allow us to show to others that we are in relationship with God. So does obedience make us better than other people? Does just obeying the law make us better than other people? The law would tell us, yes, it does. The Pharisees, the Sadducees would say, hey, look at me. I'm way better than you. I tithe. I fast. I dress myself. I wash my hands. I clean myself up. I don't do anything on the outside that defiles, but behind closed doors. This is a question we have to ask ourselves. What do we do behind closed doors? See, we can clean our act up when we come to church. Some of us put on a good show when we pull into the parking lot. I've talked about this before. The whole way to church, you're arguing, yelling, screaming at the kids. Will you sit down? Would you be quiet? Shut up. Be quiet. You know, all this happens every Sunday. What's going on? And then we pull in the parking lot. Oh, Oh, it's so good to see you, brother. Oh, it's wonderful to be here, sister. Oh, isn't this a blessed day? Meanwhile, you just cuss your kids out in the back seat because they forgot their shoes. Be honest, how many of your parents have gone halfway to church and realized your kid didn't have shoes on, huh? It happens. It didn't happen to any of you. It happened to us. (laughs) But this is what life is. And so there's no way to be perfect, but in this, God says, I'm going to offer grace. 
Legalism says your place in God's family is determined by how well you keep the rules. How well you get in, how well you stay in, how well you prove that you're keeping the rules. Often the rules cited by legalists are biblical commands, but legalists turn legitimate commands into a litmus test. So how do the apostles respond to this challenge? They tell us that God's grace, how do we know if we're full of God's grace? Because God's grace will lead us to love. God's grace will not lead us to point the finger, you did this, you did that, I'm better. God's grace in return will lead us to love one another. How will they know that we are his disciples? Because we have love one for another. God's grace leads us to love. There is no way, there's no way you're going to love her without the grace of God in your life. There's no way you're going to love that person you work with without the grace of God in your life. Teenagers, there's no way you're going to love that teenager that's been picking on you, making fun of you in your own nature, in your own strength. It's only by the grace of God that you're able to say, you know what? You can pick on me all you want, but I'm still going to love you because I've got the love of Christ in me. There's no way you're going to love that nosy neighbor. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. No way you're going to love them but by the grace of God. You see, we want to point the finger, but God says, no, 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 no. You need to show my love. Verses 13 to 21, James points out that love is always better than the law. Love is always always better than the law. Why? Because love is better than law at unifying the people of God. What brought the early church together? It was a love for Jesus Christ. It was a love for what he was doing. Jesus said, I want you to go and wait in the upper room. And when you're in the upper room, he said, then, then, then when you're all together, when you're unified together, I will pour out my spirit." You see, it was the love for Christ that brought them together. It was a love for Christ that unified them. And when we as a church are coming together in the love of Christ, when we're unified together, then God can do amazing things. God can do miracles in your life that you never thought possible before. God can bring your son, your daughter to church. God can bring your mom, your dad to church. God can bring your wayward kids to church. Why? Because it is the love of Christ that brings us together. When other people see the love of Christ, they say, man, I want that. I desire that. But if all they see in the church is, and I don't like what they did there. Who in the world is going to go to a church like that? But when they hear us talking about the love of Jesus, man, when I, went, when I was at church today, it was amazing. I saw these people come in. <laughs> True story this morning. I won't point out who they are, but somebody was visiting. They came in, and they saw a family member, and like, oh, I haven't seen you. And then all of a sudden I see a man and a woman running together that are related. Where did they meet? Where did they catch up? Here at church. Why? Because love brings people together. The love of Christ brings people together. Love unifies. Love builds up. It does not condemn. It does not put down. The love of Christ builds up the body of faith. But if we are a law church and just always about this and always about that, then there isn't anybody that's going to want to be a part of it. God says, I desire for you to be full of love, full of grace. Love is better than the law because it brings people together. Not about keeping rules that make us better than other people. It's about loving one another. And here's the key, sacrificially. Loving one another sacrificially. The word of God says putting someone else above you. But we don't like that. Why? Because the world says, get all you can for yourself. It's all about you. It's all about you. We sing, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. But all throughout the week, it's all about me, Jesus. It's all about me. <laughs> Why? Because we're selfish by nature. Why did Eve eat the fruit? Because it was a selfish desire. It's about me. I want to be like God. Oh, if, oh man, if I eat this fruit, then I'll have all the wisdom and knowledge that God does. But he says, no, it's not about you, it's about him. It's about loving others sacrificially, doing things. When's the last time you did something sacrificially just to bless somebody else? Not to get anything in return. You see, they, they, see some of you are saying, well, I did this for so-and-so, and they never thanked me. Shame on you for wanting thanks in the first place. Yes, we should thank people for what they do for us. But if God says to do it, then we do it out of a generous heart. We do it out of a sacrificial heart. Why? Because we want to show the love of Jesus Christ. When's the last time you blessed somebody? 
just to be a blessing to them? When's the last time you gave out of the lack that you have just because you knew that they were in greater need? See, because of grace, we are encouraged to avoid certain things. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is great. And yet we are encouraged to avoid certain things. We're encouraged that the law does have a place in our lives. There are aspects of the law that we should desire to uphold. Look at verse 20, Acts 15. But we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. You see, Paul and Barnabas and, and James didn't just say, well, yeah, we're going to let them have grace, and, 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 and that's good enough, and we'll just let them keep on fornicating. We'll let them keep on murdering. We'll let them keep on strangling. We'll let them keep on doing these traditions. He says, no, 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 no. We see, because of the grace of God that comes in, there's a transformation that also should take place on the outside. You see, avoiding immorality out of love for God and others is what we need to do. We should desire to avoid immorality out of love for God and for others. Yes, we are saved by grace, hallelujah. But at the same time, should we keep on sinning? Should we keep on doing what we did? No, we need to avoid that immorality in our lives. We need to start letting God do what God can do. We need to stop letting ourselves dictate things. We need to say, God, only you can change my heart. God, only you can change that person. God, only you can make me different. It's not by law. It's not by regulation. It's only by you. And how does that happen? When we accept Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in. And it's the Holy Spirit that begins to work in our heart and work in our life. It's the Holy Spirit that begins to lead us, to prompt us, to convict us. You see, once we become a Christian, the Spirit of God now begins to work on the inside. The Spirit of God begins to take control. This is what Paul tells us in Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the life-giving Spirit in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law could not do because it has weakened through the flesh. By sending his own Son in the likeness sinful flesh and concerning sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled where? In us. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. Let me tell you something. All of the laws of the Old Testament were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And this is what this last verse I just read says. It is being fulfilled. The works of the Spirit are rising up. And the Spirit confirms all that God had established. The Spirit confirms all that God was doing in our lives. So we now no longer walk by the flesh, but we are walking according to the Spirit. Church, this is what happens when the Spirit gets a hold of my life. This is what happens when the Spirit gets a hold of your life. The Spirit, the Bible says, begins to beckon me. The Spirit begins to lead me. The Spirit begins to walk. I begin to walk in the Spirit. I begin to be led by the Spirit. I begin to be, get prodded by the Spirit. I get a little goose from the Spirit every once in a while saying, uh-uh, you shouldn't be doing that. I get the little conviction in my life that says, hold on a second, you're saved by grace. Don't you realize that, that you're no longer that person, you're this person, and you shouldn't be doing that any longer? See, let's talk about how this Christianity really works. Friends, you can't cage Christianity. You can't put Christianity in a box. Christianity is a living, breathing, growing force that is propelled by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not just a nice little prayer. Oh, Jesus, come into my life, change me, and that's it. Uh-uh. If you truly mean it, the Bible says the Spirit of God will come inside of you. And the Spirit of God is a living, powerful force that will drive you, that will, will, will lead you, that will guide you, that will propel you. The Bible says that he will, he, will, he will walk beside you. Why? So that you can live for God. We are changed and transformed by God. We get this strange thing going on on the inside. When we give our life to him, all of a sudden this strange thing begins to happen on the inside of us. We're going over here and we're going to do something that we used to do before we gave our life to the Lord. And we're like, you hear this voice, don't do that. Don't do that. Well, what, what, what? I always do. That. Don't do that. Your life's different now. Oh, but wait, but, but I always did that. Yeah, don't do that. And we get into a little argument with God. Why? Because all of a sudden there's a change happening on the inside. And God is working out our salvation with fear and trembling. God is working out our salvation 
He's moving us through the power of his Holy Spirit. Be careful, don't go over there. Well, why not? I always go that. No, don't go that way. You see, the Spirit knows. The Spirit leads. The Spirit guides. Watch out! What's the sky falling? No, no, no. Watch out because if you go that way, you'll be tempted and you'll, you, you might give in to that temptation and you're not the same as you used to be. But I always did that. And the Holy Spirit says, no. That was the past. Don't you recognize that grace makes all things new? Why? Because we're now being led by the Spirit. That word led, led literally means this. The translation literally means this. Being carried by the Holy Spirit. We are being carried by the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you how many times growing up, when I was a, when I was a teenager, even into my adulthood, how many times I desired to do something. I was going somewhere, and I was, I was going out to a party. I was going out with my friends, going out to a party. And, and all of a sudden, I was, it was like I was carried by the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, I wind up all the way back here at my house playing Parcheesi with my family. When I wanted to be over here having a good time with my, my football buddies. And yet the Holy Spirit picks me up. He carries me all the way back over here. And I go, wait a second, I want to be over there. I don't want to be over here playing Parcheesi. And the Holy Spirit says, no, no, this is where you need to be because I'm protecting you from what's happening over there. Why? Because we become different and our desires become different. And yes, oh, that was what we used to do. Every Friday night I used to do this. Every Saturday I used to do that. But the Holy Spirit saying, no, 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 your life has changed now by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we become a Christian, all those things don't just disappear right away and it's like, woo, hallelujah, I'm never going to give back into sin. No, God says we are working it out. God and the Holy Spirit's working it out inside of us. He prods us, woo, and he kicks us and moves us over to where we need to be. I don't know how many nights I spent uh, instead of out partying with my friends, spending in the kitchen with my mama, <laughs> making brownies or something. I want to be out. God says, no. How many times in my college days, in my young adult age, did I want to go do this and go do that? And the Holy Spirit said, no, no, no. I have a better call for you. I have a better thing for you. You see, this all happens when we allow for ourselves to be led by the Spirit. You see, if we desire to be led by the law, the Bible says by nature we are lawbreakers. Isn't that the case? Oh, speed limit's 55. I can go 65. No big deal. <laughs> no problem. Why? Because by nature we're lawbreakers. But by the Spirit we are being led, we are being carried. The Spirit of God picks us up. He takes us to where we need to be. He carries me from place to place. In key moments of your life, the Holy Spirit would say to you, this is not where you need to be. Come over here. Some of you go kicking and screaming, but no, I want to be over there. No, Holy Spirit, no. <laughs> and yet when you're obedient to the Holy Spirit, others take notice. Others see a change in your life. As many as are led by the Spirit, it says these are the sons of God. See, church, this is what happens at salvation. So many times people give their lives to Jesus Christ and they go right back to the old lifestyle because they don't know yet. They don't know yet. They give their life to the Lord, and they're like right back at it. Like, well, this is what I do on Saturday nights. This is what I've done for the past 20 years of my life on Saturday night. And they go right back to it, and all of a sudden, as they start to go back to it, the Holy Spirit says, no, time to change. You're like, but I always do it. No, time to change. No. And the Holy Spirit begins the work. The Holy Spirit begins the transformation. That's why it is so important for us as a church. When somebody gives their life to Jesus Christ, when we see people accepting the Lord as their Savior week in and week out, our purpose is to pray for that person. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be heavy upon them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead and guide them. I pray that as they start this new journey as a believer, that your Holy Spirit would allow for them to recognize that their life is now different. And you see, it's the Holy Spirit that does the work. Before you met Jesus... You all were good sinners. You were all good sinners before you met Jesus. Why? Because it was natural. Hey, I can do this, I can do that, and I can do it better than that person. I can sin better than this person. But after you met Jesus, guess what? You're all bad sinners now. <laughs> You're all bad sinners. Let me tell you why. It's because it's harder for you to sin because you now have the conviction of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Because when you go to sin, the Spirit of God's like, no, you shouldn't do that. So you have this wrestling match that is going on. Why? Because the Spirit is alive telling you, don't do that. But the flesh is saying, eh, go ahead, you used to do it before. Your friends begin to say, hey, 
What's wrong with you? When you start listening to the Spirit, your friends will be like, what's wrong with you? That church got, they got in your head, didn't they? <laughs> no, no, that wasn't church. It wasn't church. Why? Because you begin to do things differently. You do things differently. You see something is happening in your heart. And the Spirit's saying, hey, 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 hey. Time to go this way instead of that way. And pretty soon you're like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> what has happened to me? I'm not the same person I used to be. Glory, hallelujah, you've been changed by the power of God. <laughs> you're no longer the same. You've been bought with a price. It is God. And now you're a bad sinner. Why? Because the Spirit is changing your appetites. He is now beckoning, leading, carrying, guiding. The Spirit is prodding you. And you don't want to do the same thing you used to do anymore. Even though the flesh says, yeah, go ahead. The Spirit is saying, no, no, no. You're changed. You're different. Let me close with this. Romans 8, verse 14 through 16. So then, brothers and sisters, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, we talked about this, you will surely die. If you give in to the appetites of the flesh, if you live according to the flesh, you will surely die. Verse 13, he goes on to say, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There are rules, there are regulations, and there are all kinds of rules and regulations. And if you try to live up to every one of them, you will surely die. But if you are being led by the Spirit, if you are full of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says that you will surely live. Why? Because all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, leading again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. See, this is how we become a man. This is how we become a woman of integrity. It's in the secret place that you become constant with what you do in the public place. It's what you do in secret that makes you constant in the public. What are you doing behind closed doors? What are you doing when nobody else is looking? Are you honoring the Holy Spirit and his leading? Because what you do behind closed doors is what becomes constant in your life in public. This is how you can have a life of no condemnation. God's word said there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you want that life, it's being led by the Spirit. We need to pray, Holy Spirit, release me not to focus on myself, but to focus on God. Holy Spirit, my desire is to turn my eyes upon Jesus. I want to focus on his majesty, on his glory, on his goodness. I want to focus on his grace. You see, church, the Spirit takes over on the inside, and he transforms the outside. There's an activation on the inside and it results in an overwhelming sensation to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Who are you in Christ Jesus? That's what the most, the, most of us are seeking, to simply know, who am I? God, who am I? As young people, as teenagers, are always asking the question, who am I in this grand scheme of things? God, I, I'm trying to find my identity. Who am I? When we accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and the Holy Spirit confirms that we are adopted children of God. We are no longer strangers, we're no longer aliens, we're no longer searching for a place. God tells us right here in verse number 15 that we are adopted children of God and we can cry out to him, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, Lord, you are my dad, you are my father, I am no longer lost, I'm no longer going astray, but Lord, you are with me. And this cry comes from deep within, a deep cry, Abba, Father. So what does God want us to learn from this chapter? What is he trying to say to us from Acts 15? I believe that as members of God's family, we are to be people of grace and love, not the law. For grace brings life and the law kills. A church that is full of grace is a church that is full of love. A church that is full of love is a church that brings unity, a church that brings people together. A church that is full of love is a place where Jesus Christ is glorified, where we're focused on him, not on me. If we're focused on the law, it says don't do this, don't do that. But the Spirit of God living inside of us compels us to live according, to live obedient to God's words. You see, let the Spirit of God do that work. Let the Spirit of God do that work. You see somebody struggling in their life, would you pray for them instead of condemning them? You see, we're so quick to condemn one another, but the Bible says pray for your brother or sister. Lift them up, encourage them. You see somebody struggling and, and they're, they're having a hard time, why don't you come alongside them, put their arm around them and say, hey, you know what, I used to be there in my life. 
I'll, I'll help you be accountable. We'll pray together. We'll walk this journey together. It means so much more than just pointing out and saying, well, I'm glad I'm not like them. Oh, but you were. But by God's grace, you've been saved and transformed by his power. As members of God's family, we are to be people of grace and love. Yet we are called to live as those who desire obedience to God through his Holy Spirit. We're called to love. And yet we are called to be obedient as the Spirit of God leads us and calls us. Oh God, my desire is to worship you, to love you with all my heart, to be led by your Spirit. Lord, as I'm led by your Spirit, I will obey and follow your word. I will obey what your word says. Why? So that my light might shine, the light of Christ might shine through me, so that others might come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We stand here this morning. As we close this morning, I ask the worship team to come and just begin to play softly. But maybe all of your life you've been told you have to follow rules, you have to follow regulations. It's this way or that way. It's this or that. If you want to get to heaven, you have to be a good person. You have to do certain things. You have to say this. You have to do that. Friends, I'm here to tell you that those are all lies from the enemy. Because none of us can match up to those rules and regulations. The word of God tells us that it is simply by accepting the grace that God offers through his son, Jesus Christ. There is no excuse. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand. I killed somebody. Pastor, I committed adultery. Pastor, I'm really angry at this person. I've lusted after this person. I've stolen. I've done this. I've done that. God's not going to accept me. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the world won't accept you. They'll condemn you. But God says, I accept you. I welcome you with open arms. Because it's only by coming to me that I'm able to allow for the blood that my son shed on Calvary's cross to forgive you. So you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus. You've just been waiting to make things right, trying to get things worked out. But you heard the message this morning that God is a forgiving and a loving God. You say, Pastor, I need to accept him today. I want to know for sure that my life belongs to him. Today I want to surrender to him. Today I want to go from trying to please everyone to receiving his grace desiring just simply to honor him. Is that you this morning? Pastor, I want to give my life to you. I want to give my life to you. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Probably the person in front of you or behind you, at one point in their life, they were struggling with this same question. And they had to say yes to Jesus, just like you're having to say yes to him right now. So don't be intimidated. Don't be fearful. That's just the enemy trying to lie to you. But the Holy Spirit is saying, reach out. Reach out to him. You want to know him today. You want to accept him as your Savior. We're going to say a simple prayer this morning. Pray this prayer to say, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me my sins. Accept you as my Savior. If that's your desire this morning as you pray this prayer, the Bible says that God will confirm in your heart the work that he's doing through his Holy Spirit. He'll confirm it. This is what I want to do. If that's you and you say, Lord, would you come into my life today? I want to accept you as my Savior. I'm just going to ask that, that you just simply step out from where you're at, not to embarrass you, not to make you feel lower, but so that you can be encouraged by stepping out in faith and saying, yes, Lord, in my life, be glorified. Be glorified. If there's any of you here this morning that say, yes, I want to accept him as my Savior, I'm going to ask that you just step right down here with me this morning. Just, just step down here. Just as he's come, is there anybody else? Lord, I want you to come into my life today. I want to give my life to you nothing to be embarrassed about we're all here together you see we're all sinners we're all some of us have done things that you would look at and say how in the world did they get saved but god is just calling you feel that holy spirit calling is there anybody else that would join yes amen anybody else just come and say yes i want to give my life to the lord today
give my life to you. I give my life to you. I surrender to him. We're going to extend this and open it up a little bit further this morning in these altars. Maybe you've been, been, you've given your life to the Lord, but you've been trying to live by the rules and regulations still. You haven't allowed yourself to be set free by the Spirit. And this morning you say, Lord, I just want to give you complete control. I want to surrender my life to the Holy Spirit, and I want to be led by Him. How many of us this morning would come to these altars and say, yeah, that's my desire, just to be filled with the Spirit, to be used by the Spirit, that my life will be changed and transformed by the Spirit of God. Come on, just make your way out. Just make your way out to these altars. This is what God wants to do. This is more important. Trust me, friends, what happens around here and what happens in this service today is far more important than the outcome of the Super Bowl that's going to happen later. That Super Bowl isn't going to change your life. Only God can change your life. I don't even care if you bet on the Super Bowl and you bet on the winning team. That winning bet isn't going to change your life. Only God's going to change your life. So let's just take these next couple of moments and just press in and say, Holy Spirit, use my, make me new. I want to follow your spirit. I want to be led by your spirit. I want to get the holy boot of the Holy Spirit when I'm going the wrong direction. I want the Holy Spirit to pick me up and carry me to where I need to be. Lord, would you lead me? Would you move in my life? Hallelujah. If you came forward for salvation, we're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask all of us just to join in together. Maybe you stayed back, and that's okay. God can hear you from where you're at. But we're just going to pray this prayer. Would you repeat this after me? your desires to accept him and maybe you're just recommitting your life to him let's pray this together dear jesus dear jesus today i believe today i believe that i need a savior and i need a savior i recognize that i am a sinner i recognize that i'm a sinner there is nothing that i can do there's nothing that i can do to free me from the consequence of sin from the consequence of sin it is only through you jesus it's only through you jesus that i have hope that i have hope I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I accept you. I accept you. As my Savior. As my Savior. I pray now, Lord. I pray now, Lord. That your Holy Spirit. That your Holy Spirit. Would live in me. Would live in me. Leading me. Leading and guiding me. Guiding me. To follow you. Follow you. Helping me on this journey. Helping me on this journey. To be used for you. Used for you. So that others might see Christ in me. So that others might see Christ in me. In Jesus' name, I pray. In Jesus' name. As we just remain in this atmosphere, in this attitude, I know there's many that you come. This is a time just for you and the Lord right now, just to press in. To press in. To allow God to stir in your heart and to move you into that place where you need to be. You need to be there. It's not by the work. It's by grace. It's by grace, it's by grace, it's by grace, it's by grace, it's by grace. And because of grace, my desire is not to sin anymore. My desire is to be changed and transformed. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, would you do a work in our lives? Lord, would you touch and move? Would you stir? Would you pour out your spirit, Lord God? May we be a church on fire. May we be a church so in love with you, God, that others desire to be a part. When we be a people, Christ followers, that are so on fire that others would say, yeah, I want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Lord, would you do your work? Would you do your work? Lord, this is a holy moment right here. It's a holy moment. We just take this time. We just take this time. Take this time. Maybe you need to turn to somebody on your left and right and just ask them, is there anything I can pray with you about? And just pray for one another before we go. Just pray for that person. Listen, I believe that all of us have some prayer need. And it's wonderful when people come and agree. Can we just do that for these next couple of moments? As the worship team just sings this, this powerful song, Holy Moment, can we just take a couple of moments and pray for one another? You may not say, I don't know how to pray. That's okay. The disciples didn't know how to pray. That's why they asked Jesus. All you have to do is just ask what's your need and say, Lord, would you meet that need? That's as simple as ask to do. Pray with your husband, pray with your wife, pray with somebody that you may not know this morning. And we're just going to worship him. We're going to close out by praying for one another. Just worship him with this song. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Lord, touch your church. Touch your people, Lord God. Lord, as we minister to one another, as we share these needs with one another, Father, would you meet these needs? 
Lord, in this holy moment, would you set us apart for your glory and your honor? Lord, heal the sick. Bind up broken wounds and broken hearts. Lord, meet the needs. Lord, God, financially provide for those that are in need. Oh, Lord, God, would you do the work that only you can do? Lord, restore marriages How much expectation? Lord, restore relationships with sons and daughters. Oh, in the name of Jesus.
expectation everything abandoned here to see the glory of our god lift our voice to heaven jesus is our anthem celebrate the wonder of your love Yeah.